following is an interview with novelist and short story writer Gene Wolfe, conducted by Chris Merrick for the American Audio Prose Library in April of 1984 at the author's home in Barrington, Illinois, a few miles north of Chicago. Mr. Wolfe is one of the most highly respected writers in the field of science fiction. He's won two Nebula Awards, presented by the Science Fiction Writers of America, and the Chicago Foundation for Literature Award for a mainstream novel entitled Peace. Mr. Wolf recently completed a seven-year project, The Book of the New Sun, a four-volume series which provoked such authors as Harlan Ellison to say that Gene Wolfe is now succeeding in writing everyone else under the table. One reason the series took seven years to write is that Wolfe, until 1983, had a full-time job and wrote only in his spare time. Gene Wolfe was born in 1931 and spent much of his childhood immersed in fantasy and adventure novels. He attended engineering school at Texas A&M. He, his wife Rosemary, and their family later moved to Ohio and then to Illinois where he became a senior editor of a monthly engineering journal. He began selling stories in the early 60s and publishing novels in the 70s, writing only when he had time. When you have only two hours a day to write, Wolf has said, you can write in the back of a pickup truck going down an interstate highway. But with those two hours a day, Wolf has published eight novels, one essay collection, and four books of short stories. I discovered uh, pulp magazines, which were just in their, their dying day then. And uh, I would go to the Richmond Pharmacy and get a pulp magazine, Planet Stories, or Thrilling Wonder Stories, or Weird Tales, my favorite fant famous fantastic mysteries, and uh, hide behind the candy counter and read the shortest story in the magazine as fast as I could, try and get finished with it before the pharmacist saw me and kicked me out of the drugstore. Uh, if I won... If I got finished before he saw me, I stuck the magazine back on the rack and slunk out of the drugstore, and I could come back next day. And if he won, if he caught me, I'd, he'd be on the lookout for me for another three or four days. And so I had to stay away for half a week or more. And if I wasn't too lucky, the magazine would go off sale, and I'd never get to finish the story. I'm speaking today with uh, Mr. Gene Wolf. He's the author of The Fifth Head of Cerberus, Peace, and the book of the new sun, among other books and short stories. And I'd like to start off just by asking you some very basic questions about your background, such as where were you born and raised, and uh, where did you go to school? I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I wasn't raised there, and as a matter of fact, my parents were living there when I was born. I claim to have been born by mail order. They were living in New Jersey, but. We moved away very, very soon after that. Uh, my father was from southern Ohio. Neither of my parents were native New Yorkers or anything like it. My mother was from North Carolina. And uh, they moved around for the first ten years or so of my life. We hopped all over the country, I would say, and uh, ended up in uh, Houston, Texas, after a short period of living in Dallas, Texas. And I grew up, actually, in Houston, Texas. Uh, I went in, went to Texas A&M, which is sort of like a, a cross between a concentration camp and a college. And uh, it's a very military school, or it was in my day, a very military school set out in the middle of the prairie. And went there for two and a half years, flunked out of that. Uh, dropped out of school and lost my student deferment, got drafted for uh, the Korean War and served in the infantry during the latter part of the Korean War. I uh, came back, went on the GI Bill to the University of Houston, and finally graduated, got a degree. Did you do a lot of reading all this time? Oh, yes. I, I was a very sickly kid, actually. I had uh, infantile paralysis, which I finally recovered completely. But uh, apparently that was the first in a long line of uh, fairly minor diseases. But uh, it kept me from being uh, anything like the the star outfielder on a baseball team. And as a result, I did a lot of reading. I played a lot of chess and uh, old board games like Monopoly. Uh, another part of it, actually, is that Houston, uh, during most of the year, is extremely hot. Uh, 
And uh, at the time that I was a kid growing up there, nobody had air-conditioned cars, nobody had air-conditioned houses. Uh, the only things, there, there was air conditioning, but the, the only places you ever found them were the movie theaters and the big department stores. I can remember, well, we used to go uh, to the movies, the matinee, and that, practically every day in the hottest part of the summer, basically to get out of the heat. My father would come out of the, the theater and wrap his handkerchief around his hand so that he could open our car door. And when you have that kind of heat, uh, you tend to do things that you can do indoors in the shade in front of an electric fan, uh, like read or play chess or whatever. And so I did a great deal of it. Uh, my parents, neither of my parents had gone to college. I don't think either of them uh, had anything that could could reasonably be called an education. But they were uh, both very intelligent people, and they both read a great deal. And they seemed to expect me to do it, and I did. Was this adventure stories, science fiction? It was uh, a bit of everything. I remember uh, my father gave me H.G. Wells' History of the World, for example. I read that. Uh, I read Oz books and Lewis Carroll and God knows what. I read a great many mysteries because my mother was a mystery fan, and as a result, we had what in those days were 25-cent paperback books scattered all over the house. And so I read a lot of Valerie Queen, who was one of her favorite other mystery things. Uh, I started reading science fiction, actually, because I fell off my bicycle. That meant that I couldn't ride my bicycle to junior high school. My mother had to take me in the car, and she came to pick me up one time, and she had the pocketbook of science fiction lying on the seat of the car beside her. I didn't know it, but that was the first reprint short story anthology in paperback books of science fiction. Uh, edited by Donald A. Wolheim, who now is a publisher, has his own publishing company. Uh, I liked the cover, and she didn't much like the stories, and so I stole the book from her, essentially. Or I got her to give it to me, is what it came down to. Uh, the first story I will never forget, it was uh, Theo Theodore Sturgeon's Microcosmic God, and uh, that, I think, was uh, the story that hooked me. In fact, I'm certain that was. I'd like to just ask you about some of the characters in the Book of the New Sun. Uh, quite a few of them are what you might expect, a warrior cast or peasants or religious figures, but you have some odd characters who pop up, and I was wondering if you might just explain what you were thinking of when you created them. I'll just throw the names out. Um, Baldanders, the giant. Well, Baldanders is the sort of scholar that you had in the Middle Ages who dug back into the learning of classical times. But in his period, when he digs back into the learning of the past, he finds the physical and biological science uh, that we're starting to develop now. And uh, he continues to dig, and at the same time, he uses the, the science to make improvements on his person. Uh, he's that great American hero, the self-made man, in the most literal sense. And, of course, he discovers uh, one of the, the givens of this series is that the way to achieve uh, eternal physical life on Earth is to continue to grow, to, uh, to remain juvenile, so to speak, uh, so that the, the death process doesn't take over, uh, which gives you longer life, indeed, but uh, which results in you becoming larger and larger, which is why Bald Anders is now a giant. How about Dorcas? You said you were as surprised as Severian was when she popped up out of nowhere. Yeah, and, and now you're asking me to explain uh, why I invented her and put her in the book. And of course I didn't. She put herself in the book. Uh, you have to, to remember that the, the commerce between an author and his characters is not... Uh, the author is not a, a slave driver, and the, the, the characters are automatons who, who walk and talk as he directs them to do. Uh, the characters uh, exert their own influence on the author and make their own demands on the story. And occasionally, uh, a character like uh, Dorcas simply walks on stage, so to speak, and uh, begins to play her own part. And at this point, it, it's the author's uh, duty or the playwright's duty to frantically rewrite the script so that she fits into it somewhere. And this is what she did. Uh, Dorcas uh, 
pushed me around. Sometimes it's uh, rather scary. You've invested a great deal of time and effort into a book, and uh, at some point one of your characters sits down and says, now look here, I'm not going to do this to you. Uh, this isn't me, right? And uh, so you're you're very much in the, the sort of uh, situation that a movie director is, uh, working with a bunch of temperamental stars, most of whom make more money than he does. Uh, after all, you know, some of, some of my characters are, are rulers and warriors and whatnot, and uh, I have a tough time sitting at my desk and uh, giving these people orders. You know, they laugh at me. How about the green man? I put him in there to show what one uh, possible potential solution could be to the society's problems, because the society is, is losing its soil, uh, it's exhausted its resources, and so on. And uh, in a novel like this, in which you have time travel, pardon me, you have time travel, uh, it's not only reasonable for the characters to bounce around in time, as, as they do somewhat, uh, but it's also reasonable for people from the far future just to come back and have a look and see what's going on. The green man is one of those people, of course. The, the green man got trapped and uh, put in essentially a medicine show from which Severian uh, rescues him because he is green. Uh, what he has done, what his society has done, is uh, take over the sort of uh, what is photosynthetic uh, process that plants use to derive energy directly from the sun and apply it to themselves. And uh, thus, of course, he's green because he's full of chlorophyll. Uh, there were, or there are, uh, legends uh, in medieval Europe of the existence of green men who were much closer to plants uh, than uh, the ordinary human beings were. And it's always struck me that one possible explanation for those green men is that they were time travelers from some future at which we'd learn to take over the plant's processes. Uh, they went back to a period at which we thought uh, people were too unsophisticated to realize what was going on and did a little looking around and as a result they show up on the edges of illuminated manuscripts and in some very old church statuary and this sort of thing. Uh, there are all sorts of things that were, were banging around the world a thousand years or so ago that we really can't explain, that we just try and sweep under the, the rug. Uh, people in uh, medieval Europe uh, knew that their woods were inhabited by primitives who were much more primitive uh, than the medieval Europeans were, and we pretend that they're legends, they don't exist. Uh, there's very considerable evidence for uh, the existence of a, a very small uh, Caucasian race in Europe during the Dark Ages, probably a uh, holdover from ne the Neolithic period. Uh, but uh, again, it's inconvenient for us to talk about this sort of thing, and so we pretend that the fairy tales and so on that tell us about this race uh, are just uh, nonsense, moonshine and so on. Uh, they actually... Uh, People were reporting them in law courts in Scandinavia as late as the 18th century. I mean, so this is sworn testimony for who did you talk to, who was there, and so on. But uh, there's no scientific uh, recognition, really, of these people. Uh, so they, they tend to cluster more than any place else, of course, about the British Isles. Uh, Britain, Scotland, uh, Ireland are all famous for... The constant fairy tales, the little people. Uh, but uh, we pretend it's all moonshine and that they had wings like dragonflies and were about three inches high. Uh, actually, uh, elves were an L high. That was why they were called elves. They were approximately 40 inches high. That was what an L was. It was a length of a war arrow. Pardon me, a war arrow or the, uh, the distance from the man's, uh, the bowman's outstretched hand that held the bow to his ear, which was where he pulled the uh, arrow to. Uh, I think that uh, there's a great deal more in the past uh, than we are willing to recognize because it's, it's inconvenient, it's uh, disturbing for us, and 
the corollary to that is that there will be much more in the future, and we are willing to recognize now. Uh, occasionally, I get bitterly criticized for not predicting the sort of futures that uh, people feel uh, are real and inevitable and certain to come about, and consequently, I am a bad man. Uh, you know, I don't think that uh, the whole future is going to consist of uh, better and better machines and more and more plastic, which is what they would like to think that it's going to consist of. Uh, if I look at the, the kind of people that they are and put them somewhere in the past and have them predict what the future would be like, I see that our, our present is nowhere near like this prediction. Uh, look at what people in the 19th century, say, oh, 1850 or so, uh, thought that our life was going to be like now. And uh, you'll find that they were very, very far off the mark. They thought that the industrial age was going to get more and more industrial. Uh, steam was going to be continue, going to be used uh, for everything, I assume, to the point where eventually we would have steam spaceships and so on. And uh, it hasn't worked like that. I like steam airplanes myself, which I, I try and stick in here and there. The idea of somebody on an airplane shoveling coal into the boiler as the thing goes along appeals to me. But uh, it hasn't really happened. Well, that brings up an interesting idea, though, about the future of the human race. I think you're interested in it. You seem to be positive about the human race evolving and perhaps rather than becoming more technological, becoming more human or more compassionate? Well, I think it's already very obvious that if that doesn't happen, we're headed toward extinction. Now, we may very well be headed toward extinction, but uh, as more and more power is put into the hands of people, uh, the people are going to have to become more compassionate, uh, more human, more humane, or they're going to kill each other off. Uh, suppose that you, you went back to the Dark Ages when you had uh, wandering war bands, of various barbaric tribes and so on, and you gave all those people machine guns. Uh, Europe would soon be pretty well uninhabited. Uh, and we're going to get, uh, we are getting, we've already got uh, the future machine guns, more and more of them not only uh, nuclear weapons, although that's the most obvious example, but high-energy beams, lasers, masers, and so on, biological weapons, and whatnot. Uh, we're not going to be able to tolerate forever a uh, world in which uh, little bands of terrorists go around planting car bombs because the car bombs are going to become more and more destructive. Let's turn to that. The Book of the New Sun featured four books called The Shadow of the Torturer, The Claw of the Conciliator, The Sword of the Lictor, and The Citadel of the Autark. And all of them combined were around 1,100 pages, and you have said it took you seven years to write that series. I would like to ask, uh, what started you on a project that large? Well, I, I feel that uh, when a writer starts, he should have... Uh, he should know the ending. He should know about what the, the story is going to look like uh, when he, he begins. Uh, otherwise, he's going to have a lot of problems along the way. And I started out to write a novel, pardon me, a novelette or a novella, and uh, it got completely out of hand and kept going and going and going. Uh, in those days, Damon Knight was publishing uh, an original anthology called Orbit. Uh, this was intended uh, as a submission to that anthology. I figured 20,000 words or so, something along those lines. And uh, I wrote the 20,000 words and I realized I had only just barely begun the story with the 20,000 words. So I thought, well, I've got a novel on my hands and I'll do it as a novel. And I wrote another 100,000 words or so and realized that after the, that 100,000 words, I had the book now well underway with that 100,000 words. So I decided I had a trilogy. And uh, trilogies were fairly fashionable in those days. So uh, I kept writing and finally ended the thing with uh, three books, which is what a trilogy is supposed to have. 
and laid the three stacks of manuscript side by each and discovered that the last stack was about twice as long as the first two. So I decided I had a tetralogy, and fortunately I was uh, able to find a publisher who agreed with me, or an editor, I should say, who agreed with me. What was the germ of the story then? You have uh, the main character, Severian, and what did you want to do with him that you went from a 20,000-word novella to a an 1,100-page tetralogy. Well, essentially, I wanted to, to write a book about somebody who wasn't Captain Ransom, who was different from the sort of uh, sympathetic hero or central figure that we usually get. Uh, I wanted to take somebody who's normally labeled as being one of the bad guys and do a story from his side of it. Uh, so Severian is a professional torturer. Uh, I got the, the torture idea. Uh, while sitting in a uh, a panel, a program on uh, costuming. I started sulking it as I listened to the, the various participants in the program over the fact that no one had ever done one of my characters as a masquerader. I started thinking, what characters have I done that they should be doing and would do if they weren't cheating me out of my just desserts and so on? And I realized that I hadn't done many characters who would uh, go over well in a masquerade. So I, sitting there, I made one up. And I got uh, the torturer's outfit, the black cloak, black trousers, bare chest, black boots, and so on. And uh, from what they'd told me on the panel, I knew that would be an easy costume to do. So I thought, what can I do with this, this man here? I've got this torture that I would like to use. And uh, so I started thinking about him, and so on. So uh began to think about the, the life, what kind of life uh, somebody who was a professional torturer might live either in the past or in the future. And uh, pretty soon I saw that there was a story there. Uh, it's the story of a boy who starts as an apprentice torturer, uh, becomes a journeyman torturer who actually performs tortures uh, while he's an apprentice. He does things like sweep floors and run with messages and uh, who commits a sin of mercy, uh, permitting one of the uh, clients of his guild to get off with somewhat less pain than she was intended to suffer, and is exiled for it. And he goes into exile, becomes in the, involved in the war that his country is fighting, and ends up as the ruler of his nation, the Commonwealth. That's the uh, story of the Tetralogy. The Tetralogy was written uh, with the idea of showing his rise from uh, the ragged apprentice boy to the throne uh, that he occupies at the end. And I'm now working on a fifth book, which I, I call a coda to the Tetralogy, uh, in which uh, Severian brings a new son to his planetary system, which the, the system needs, the old son, is dying, is gra gradually cooling off, and as a result, the, the world is entering a new ice age, which will be a terminal ice age eventually, if nothing is done. And uh, the fifth book will be about how something is done. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, mythology and Christianity in the book. Probably the easier place to start would be mythology. You have few things which remind me of, of Greek myth. Um, he, one, he's on a quest. He's traveling. Um, he enters, at one point, he's thrown into a large underground prison, it, it, an immense one. It's so huge, it, it struck me as being an underworld. Were you thinking of uh, Greek myth or other mythology when you had him embark on his uh, quest? Well, a lot of the background for the Book of the New Sun was taken from Byzantium, which was, uh, the Byzantine Empire was what the Roman Empire became called when it became more Greek, really, than Roman. And uh, a good deal of the uh, furniture of the Book of the New Sun uh, has been borrowed from Byzantium. People who read it without much historical background generally seem to feel that I'm talking about medieval Europe. And it's because they come across the word guild, and they seem to think that that's 
indicates that they're in medieval Europe and nowhere else. Uh, but actually, uh, if they thought of the uh, the Near East uh, at period of the, the late period of the Roman Empire, they would be a lot closer. Uh, so obviously, there is uh, there's a Greek feeling to it. Uh, Greek mythology comes into it perhaps somewhat. Uh, there's a Christian feeling because at that time the Roman Empire was a Christian empire and it was essentially uh, that Christian empire uh, which was destroyed by the Turks and whose destruction uh, caused what we call the Dark Ages and so on in Christianity. From the point of view of a Christian, Severian begins his life as someone who inflicts pain, and yet at the end of the book, he's gone through his uh, trials, so to speak, and has now renounced torture. He's he's become, I guess, a redeemer figure. And you've written that you thought Christ also knew what it was like to be a torturer, that he used the whip. But I was wondering, were you thinking of that when you created Severian? I, I was certainly thinking of the the relationship of pain to human life, which is one of the very central uh, relationships, one of the, the pivots. Uh, and if you're going to take a torture as a hero, you have to, or it seems to me that if, you, uh, if you're going to do that and you're going to try and write a good book, uh, you have to think uh, of such things as that all human beings suffer some pain, usually considerable pain in the part of the lifetime and uh, what the pain is good for, what it's not good for, uh, what our avoidance or attempts to avoid it uh, draw us into, and so forth. You use a couple of major symbols. One is, is roses, a kind of a growth symbol. And you use the sun. There's, it's the book of the new sun, and there's a, a mythical figure called the conciliator who will bring a new sun. And uh, these are great symbols. Is Severian a, a Christian figure, or a Christ figure, or is Severian a, a Gnostic figure? Uh, I suppose he's both. I think that uh, if uh, a Christ figure is to suffer the kind of things that mankind suffers, then one of the things that he has to suffer is doubt. Uh, because if there is no doubt, uh, there is no faith. You cannot, uh, you can't talk about faith when you're talking about something that you are certain of. Faith is the individual's commitment to what he is not certain of. So in that sense, uh, certainly, pardon me, that's badly phrased, isn't it? Uh, Severian is agnostic, yes, uh, but at the same time he is a savior figure and a Christ figure. I'd like to turn to another book which represents a different uh, way of presenting your feelings in that matter, which is The Fifth Head of Cerberus. And uh, it opens up, you mentioned H.G. Wells, and it re reminded me in, in the beginning very much of the island of Dr. Moreau. There's uh, kind of a, a Florentine civilization on this other planet, a very kind of Baroque, slow-paced society and yet uh, underneath there's a lot of activity going on in terms of people trying to advance the human race uh, the main character turns out to be a clone of his father who was also a clone so somewhere in the past someone decided to try to improve or prolong his own life through his uh, descendants um, you have surgical techniques used on human beings. You have fighting slaves. There's a man with four arms. So you have you know, this you know, actual physical restructuring of human beings. You have uh, aborigines who have a mimicking ability, and they may have be so successful at mimicry that they've uh, assimilated the human race. And all of this is, to me, wrapped around uh, the idea of evolution of, of the human race, the, People are looking to improve or to advance the human race through, through evolution. And yet, all this is presented uh, 
kind of negatively. It's not a real pleasant place to live, this city, um, to some of the experiences that the, uh, the man has as he's growing up are fairly ugly. Is, are you making a comment there in terms of evolution? Well, certainly I, I'm saying that uh, those principles, those methods, are going to be used by individuals for what they conceive as their individual benefit. And uh, as you say, the results are going to be kind of ugly. Uh, the uh, number five's father is not uh, trying to improve the human race. He's trying to improve himself and prolong himself. Uh, he's essentially a character very similar to Bald Anders, although he doesn't become a giant. He doesn't grow. But his idea is to use uh, biological science to uh, prolong his image uh, by cloning himself. And he wants to eventually uh, take over his civilization. Uh, he doesn't. He fails to do that. And his constant questioning of number five is a part of his attempt to determine uh, why he fails. The uh, aborigines are, are something uh, different and to one side. They're the sort of thing that we may meet in space. Uh, something, as you say, that's capable of mimicking us. Uh, to the point of displacing uh, individual human beings. Uh, that may happen. Uh, I suppose it's a metaphor, uh, if you like, for cultural assimilation. Uh, the Romans conquered the Greeks, but they ended up by becoming Greeks and stopping being Romans, as they themselves uh, knew uh, that that was happening uh, while it did. Uh, that's why the, the Byzantine Empire, which we were talking back uh, about uh, a while back, is basically more Greek than Roman. The Book of the New Sun is more of a, what I see as a creationist point of view, that you have a, a redeemer figure who will lead the human race into a, into a rebirth, and yet the fifth head of Cerberus is more of the, the human race taking matters into its own hands and evolving itself by force, if necessary, into a better position. How do you feel about the, the difference between creation and evolution? You're using both of them. Well, I, I think they're, they're words. Uh, and they really represent two opposed philosophies and not two, uh, two different sets of facts. Uh, both of them are, are working with the same facts, or at least they should be. Uh, and they are seeing those things differently. Uh, the evolutionists uh, see it as an automatic uh, process. Uh, the creationists uh, see it as specifically the act of God. Uh, it seems to me that there's a great deal of truth in both uh, viewpoints. And that the, the things that they are really quarreling about are not those things. Uh, God does not work by uh, reaching down a, a great hand and touching somebody on the forehead and saying, you used to be an ape, but no more. Uh, so whether, whether you want to... Uh, take that as the automatic process or, or the will of God is mostly a matter of viewpoint. I'm coming to grips with this, but uh, uh, when people had no idea of space, they never got into the void, uh, then air both was always and need not necessarily be there. Uh, air didn't count for anything because it was always there. Uh, on the other hand, it was always there. And it seems to me that God for us is like that. He is always there. And what we're, we're really talking about here is not how God thinks about us, but how we think about God, and uh, using those in various places. Uh, the people in uh, the Fifth Head Cerberus are automatic process people. Uh, the people in uh, the Book of the New Sun are uh, 
much more God-centered people. Uh, they see uh, the coming of the new son as the coming of the Savior. Uh, they see something happening uh, to save them by the interference of a higher power. But uh, it would be, again, this, this is a matter of how do you look at it. Severian has not been uh, handed a, uh, you know, a prophet's license. Uh, if he is a savior figure, then he is a savior figure because he saves, uh, not because he's been told to save. But of course, that's the idea of, of faith. Uh, they have no way of knowing that it will happen, and all they can do is hang on, uh, just as uh, the Jews, for example, have hung on for, what, 5,000 years waiting for the Messiah. We have to remember in all these things that we're talking about stories. We're not talking about uh, somebody's text and philosophy. Uh, again, I say that uh, we take a certain direction and we say, where will this go? What kind of society evolves from this type of thought combined with this type of technology? Uh, in uh, the book of the New Sun, uh, we have very definitely a collapsed civilization a civilization that used to travel to the stars and no longer does. Uh, in uh, the fifth head of Cerberus, uh, the collapse hasn't been so noticeable, but the society has stagnated just as uh, number five's line, his father and so on, back to Mr. Million, uh, have stagnated, and it's a stagnating society. I'd like to turn to uh, another book you wrote, which is called Peace, and... Uh, it's not science fiction or fantasy, and it's it's what I would call a Midwestern Gothic. I don't know if you're comfortable with that term, but when I read it, I was thinking of books like Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury or Truman Capote's childhood memoirs of this man who's lived in one town all his life, and he's writing about the stories he knows, the people that he's lived with. Uh, I was wondering, uh, where did the idea for peace come from? Holy hell. Is it autobiographical in any sense? Or Oh, it, yes. It, it has some autobiographical elements to it. I think anything that a writer writes has some autobiographical elements. Uh, it's, a, it's a small town story. Uh, I think uh, Cassonsville, which is a, the town in peace, is very similar to Logan, Ohio, which is where my father grew up where I went to visit my grandparents. Uh, but beyond that, I can't tell you quite what the origin of the book was. Were there real people that you drew upon? An Aunt, Aunt Olivia or Uncle Julius? Well, I think that you always draw on real people. Uh, usually you take, several, you take elements from several people and combine them to create a new character. But it's very hard to do a character who's like no one that you've ever known. How about Mr. Gold? Did you ever know someone who did the things he did? Uh, no, I've books? never I've never known a, a person who faked books. Uh, I anticipated the Hitler diaries, which kind of amuses me uh, with Mr. Gold. It, it simply seemed to me to be a branch of crime that nobody had really gone into. Of course, because it, it's so difficult. And, uh, by the way, I pulled him out for a book that's about to be published by a small press now called Bibliomen, uh, a book about book people. And Mr. Gold is, is definitely a book person, and uh, he has forged some of the stories in Bibliomen. We get to see a little bit more of his handiwork there. Uh, but I, I thought of a man who would do, with, uh, do for books the sort of thing that uh, uh, Zellick does for himself in the Woody Allen movie. Of course, that movie hadn't been made when I thought of it. I did have a lot of fun with uh, Gold. Uh, part of it, of course, was from the, the, oh, the Necronomicon and the other books that we uh, talk about in science fiction and fantasy that don't actually exist. The Cult of the Ghouls, which was... Uh, 
August Derowitz's uh, non-existent book. And so on. Would you consider the book a fantasy? Uh, I think that uh, any piece of fiction is a fantasy. Uh, the question is whether or not it's willing to admit it. Uh, peace is probably a little bit more willing to admit it than, uh, oh, something like Henderson, the Rain King. One of the eerie elements, I think, in the book is that Alden Dennis Weir has this house he lives in, which he's apparently built replicas of all the rooms he's lived in all his life. And uh, a friend of mine mentioned Edgar Allan Poe is doing something similar to that in stories like The Fall of the House of Usher, the idea that there's a physical, an actual physical world as a symbol for what he's thinking of. Mm. Were you thinking of Edgar Allan Poe, or have you ever used him as a model? The house is, a, is Weir's life. It's a metaphor for his life. And uh, he is exploring the various rooms, the times, the periods uh, in which he lived. But uh, I don't think I've ever consciously imitated Poe. I may have unconsciously imitated Poe. And, uh, of course, I went to Edgar Allan Poe Elementary School, which meant that I had to read things like The Mask of the Red Death in fifth grade. And uh, I think that school has probably turned out generations of weirdos of whom I am one. Another thing that you do that I perceive in your writing is to put together a short story. You do a lot of maybe a rough draft writing of the entire world or society or how a person is, and then the final copy, you are sort of skimming into a section of their life or their world. Well, I think you've got to know who the characters are. Uh, where did they come from? What kind of a, a world did they grow up in? How are they going to react? If you don't understand that about your characters, I don't think you have any business to, to write about them. You uh, rework a lot? Revise a lot? Yeah. Yeah, I probably do, oh, four drafts, most of my material, which uh, seems to be about right for me anyway. I mean, I'm tempted to do the, the S.J. Perlman thing, who... Someone asked him how many drafts he did. He said 73. He said, I, I used to do only about 64, but it, it was rough. And then I tried 81, but there was a lapidary effect. Everything was too mannered. I think 80, 73 is the right number for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, between three and four drafts seems to be about the right number for me. And, of course, if, if, something, if there's something in a draft that isn't contributing to the story... Uh, then I should cut it out. I don't won't say that I always do, because sometimes I read my published material and I see parts in there that I should have blue penciled. Uh, but that is what the author is supposed to do. Uh, the author is supposed to uh, prune the thing down uh, to where only those parts that are bearing story weight are in the story when it reaches the reader. That brings up a question which one critic mentioned about you uh, in terms of clarity versus ambiguity. And uh, in the afterword to the fifth head of Cerebus, Pamela Sargent says, uh, a great deal of science fiction seeks clarity rather than ambiguity. And she mentioned some examples in that book. And I think once again, you, cre you create a lot of background material and you skim into it and present us with part of a person's life or the world they perceive in the course of the story. Do you feel that you're an ambiguous writer? I think I, I am often because I want to be. I think the writer should be clear when he wants to be clear. He should be ambigu ambiguous uh, when he wishes to be ambiguous. But there's a great deal of ambiguity in life. And if the, uh, the idea of art is to hold up a mirror to life, and you're going to get a great deal of ambiguity out of that art. Uh, the problem or, or the writing flaw comes in when the material is ambiguous, when the uh, author doesn't want it to be. Uh, the, the clarity uh, 
thing is the, the engineer school of writing, I think, in which you often have an engineer hero, uh, and everything is logically worked out, and the book usually begins with a uh, 10 or 20 page lump in which the author explains the society, uh, which is usually boring, uh, both the explanation and the society. And uh, in my opinion, uh, 99 times out of 100, the society is much too simplistic. Uh, so I don't do those things. I take the society, which I try to make reasonably complex, I mean, as called complex as it would naturally be, uh, and uh, let my characters reveal that society as they go through the story. When did you begin writing yourself? Well, it, it depends on what you mean by begin. Uh, when I was at Texas A&M, I had a roommate who was doing illustrations for what was supposed to be the college literary magazine. And uh, he thought it would be nice if I wrote stories that he could illustrate. So, uh, so I started in that sense while I was at A&M. And then after uh, I'd gotten out of the Army and gone back to school, and I'd done another two years in college and all that, I was married. Uh, my wife and I were living in a appointed furnished apartment, a place that was actually a, sort of a padded attic with some furniture in it. And we wanted very much to get out of there, but we couldn't because we didn't have any money to put as a down payment on furniture so that we could rent an unfurnished place. And furnished places are very hard to find. And I thought, well, maybe I can uh, write something and sell it and uh, make a little money on the side. So I started trying to do that. And after a long time, it turned out I was right. But before I had ever sold anything, we were out of that apartment. Uh, the whole reason for writing that had passed by, but I continued to write anyway, I guess, out of habit. Was this science fiction or any other forms of fiction or nonfiction? I, I've never really, uh, it was all fiction. I've never really tried to write the genre. Uh, I write whatever I think uh, is a good story, and I let other people worry about which pigeonhole it goes into. Well, I'm curious about pigeonholing, because that does happen. Uh, you've written books like The Devil in a Forest, which is, I would call it, a historical fiction, or a book called Peace, which is kind of a fictional memoir of growing up in the early 20th century. But you go into the bookstore now, and Peace has got the word fantasy stamped on the spine, and it's filed away. Does that bother you? No, not in the least. Uh, I think that I have maybe a little more feeling for what publishers have to contend with than some writers do. And uh, I realize that the, the publisher is essentially trying to market the book in a, the way that he believes, at least, will prevent him to make the most money he can out of the book. And that's fine with me. I think that he should do that. A lot of science fiction writers complain about being, quote, ghettoized both in terms of, say, respect for their craft and literally in terms of finances? Well, I, first place, I, I don't think that uh, our writers uh, should be respected. It spoils them, makes them hard to get along with, like children that have been kept up too late. Uh, as far as finances are concerned, uh, I don't think that the type of book uh, has very much at all to do with uh, how big the advances are. And that's what we're talking about, the size of the advance. Uh, much, much more uh, depends on what the writer's track record has been. Uh, Robert A. Heinlein can sell a novel for a million dollars because he has a marvelous track record. Uh, what he writes is, is the definition of science fiction. If it's science fiction if it's something like the work of Robert A. Heinlein. Uh, so I, I can't say that the, the science fiction ghetto is, is penalizing him or penalizing Isaac Asimov or uh, anyone of that sort. But the thing that you have to realize is that the writer's real money depends on the amount of royalties that the book earns. You've been writing since the late 50s, and 
for at least the last 15 years or so. We've been editing a, a monthly engineering magazine, and you've mentioned that you have a limited amount of time to write. You said two hours a day, and a, a writer who has two hours a day to write can write in a pickup truck in the back of an interstate. And yet uh, you're making the plunge uh, into full-time writing. A lot of writers make a living as uh, English teachers, for example, and you've, you've been an editor. And uh, what prompted you to give all that up and go into the risky world of being a full-time writer? Uh, if I had wanted to, I could have continued to work on plan engineering. Uh, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, I don't mean that I didn't enjoy it while I did it. I did. And uh, it was very hard to leave because I was leaving behind a dozen or so very good friends, people that I'd worked with for years. But uh, what I want to do is to write things like Peace and uh, The Shadow of the Torture and The Fifth Head of Cerberus and uh, not to write uh, articles about uh, hydraulic power packages. Uh, although I, I did write some robot articles for uh, plant engineering that interested me. Uh, of course, before I was an editor, I was an engineer. And uh, I got out of that, essentially, because I got tired of it. It wasn't really what I wanted to do, and the editing was more like it. One of the offshoots of the popularity of the Book of the New Sun was a book called The Castle of the Otter. And I was wondering if you would tell us how that book came about. There's a newsletter called Locus, published for people who are interested in science fiction. And uh, I was in the, the Bay Area and was interviewed by uh, Charles N. Brown, who is the editor and publisher of Locus. And I told him uh, in a taped interview in a noisy restaurant uh, that I was working on the Citadel of the Autark. And when he published the article, the title appeared as The Castle of the Otter. And I thought, that's a very nice title. I'll just uh, do a little book that will have that title. And uh, then if Charlie will be proved to be a reliable prophet. And about that time, uh, Mark Ziesing, who owns a bookstore up in Connecticut, asked me if I wanted to do a small press book. And I said, sure, why not? I'll do The Castle of the Otter. And I, so I wrote The Castle of the Otter. Well, speaking of the Zeesing Press, you have a, this kind of quirky book called The Castle of the Otter and uh, a book about a book. And you also have uh, other small press books out, such as Planet Engineering. And uh, that's something which seems to be happening a lot in the science fiction world. And they, all of a sudden there's these $30 deluxe hardbacks with acid-free paper and sewn bindings, and uh, they print a limited edition. And uh, all of the Gene Wolfe fans will snap it up. Do you make any money out of that? Oh, certainly. Certainly. I wouldn't do it if I didn't. Uh, there aren't many copies published, but as you pointed out, the books tend to be expensive. Uh, plus, there's always the possibility that the book may be sold again after the limited edition and reach a larger audience. Uh, the Castle of the Otter became an offering from the Science Fiction Book Club, and uh, whereas Mark Ziesing had done 520 copies of Science Fiction Book Club, did I don't know how many thousand. And uh, so it is proved to be uh, a much better investment of time than I thought it was when I was writing it. What are you working on now? Oh, boy. You really opened a can of worms with that one because I have four projects going. There is a book called Free Live Free, which I'm making the final revisions on. Uh, that is kind of a borderline science fiction novel laid in the present. I'm working on The Earth of the New Sun, which is the fifth book that I talked about, the coda to The Book of the New Sun. That's about midway in second draft. 
I'm doing the first draft of a uh, sort of fantasy adventure laid in ancient Greece called Soldier of the Mist. And I am supposed to be writing an opera based on the death of Dr. Island, which is not the story that I read, but a different story, uh, in which the uh, music will be composed by Samtau Sichiritkul, and I'm supposed to be writing the libretto. Uh, I'm going to be guest of honor at the World Science Fiction Convention in Australia in 1985, and we are hoping to put on, if not the entire opera, at least some scenes from the opera in conjunction with the World Science Fiction Convention. In Volume 1 of the Book of the New Sun, Severian enters uh, the Great Library, and he runs into the Master Librarian, who says, um, A child eventually discovers on some low but obscure shelf the Book of Gold. You've never seen this book, and you will never see it being past the age at which it is met. And essentially, the Book of Gold is the one book, the the treasure book that uh, each child will find and read and remember for the rest of their life. Do you have a book of gold? I'm sure I do, but I can't remember what it is. Not right now. <laughs> Not right off. It was probably one of L. Frank Baum's Oz books, and not The Wizard of Oz, but uh, something like The Road to Oz. But I'm, I'm no longer sure just what the, the Book of Gold is. I think maybe that's uh, that's one of the reasons why we can't go back and find it when we grow older. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. books include Operation Ares, The Fifth Head of Cerberus, The Devil in a Forest, Peace, and The Book of the New Sun, consisting of four novels, The Shadow of the Torturer, The Claw of the Conciliator, The Sword of the Lictor, and The Citadel of the Autark. These are all published by Pocket Books. One essay collection, The Castle of the Otter, plus four short story collections, The Island of Dr. Death and Other Stories and Other Stories, The Wolf Archipelago, Planet Engineering, and Gene Wolfe's Book of Days. The American Audio Prose Library is a comprehensive collection of distinguished American writers reading and discussing their work. It's produced at KOPN Radio by Kay Bonetti and Julie Humans. For information about other writers in this series, write us, the American Audio Prose Library, at 915 East Broadway, Columbia, Missouri, 65201. This project is funded by KOPN Radio, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Missouri Arts Council.